Hello, Dark Reader, and welcome to the Dark Side of the Library podcast. I'm your host, Katie. On this mini so today, we will be exploring Masters of Death. This is by Olivia Blake. I'm really excited about this because I really enjoyed the Atlas series, or at least I liked the first one of the series, the Atlas Six. Uh, I don't know, did she finish it? I know I was kind of waiting on it. Maybe she has, oh, I gotta look it up. Oh, good, no, she's, it's apparently the last part of this trilogy is, it gets released January 9th. Hopefully it wraps up. So in between all of the Atlas hype, Olivia Blake has been kind of a TikTok sensation. In this particular case, I think it's very much warranted. I think Olivia Blake is a pretty amazing writer, miles and miles away from a lot of the other TikTok sensations and their books that I've read. No offense, but that's just how it's been. Masters of Death is a beautifully crafted solo novel. So let me just tell you the summary of what it's about first. Viola Merrick is a struggling real estate agent and also a vampire. Uh, Her biggest problem right now is that the house that she's actually trying to sell is haunted by a ghost named Tom. The ghost in the house has been murdered. He actually has this big gash on his chest, and she is the only one that can see him, kind of. Like, throughout the book, other people can too. So until she solves the mystery of how he died and he solves this mystery, he is just not going to move on. He refuses to leave this house. We also have another character, Fox Demora, who is a medium, and he's called upon to work with this whole situation. He is most definitely a shameless fraud, and he isn't entirely without his uses, though. He is actually the godson of death itself. Viola seeks out Fox to help her with this ghost infestation, and he then becomes very involved in this quest that neither he nor Vi expects or actually wants. There are a whole bunch of other characters that are helping in this whole situation that tends to just steamroll. We have an unruly poltergeist, a demonic personal trainer, we have a sharp-voiced angel, a love-stricken reaper, and a few high-functioning creatures, meaning archangels, and other things, like a ton. Vi and Fox soon discover the difference between a mysterious lost love and an annoying dead body isn't nearly as distinct as they thought. Honestly, this is kind of a bastardized summary, but at the same time, it's the only one that actually makes sense to describe what's going on in this novel. And I guess the other important piece of this is that there is this game that they have to participate in because of this demon or whatever. It usually involves other higher entities, you know, angels, gods, all kinds of things. So I briefly did talk about Olivia Blake a little bit, but let me go into it a little further. Like I said, she's kind of a TikTok sensation, but she is an amazing author and she has done a couple of books. So the Atlas Six is one of those things. She's also done Alone With You in the Ether or Ether. Lovely Tangled Vices, My Mechanical Romance, One for My Enemy. She definitely writes these very gothic, darker fantasy, usually contemporary and urban fantasy tales. And she's, I believe, doing some graphic novels too, which I'm really excited about. It looks really cool. The art is amazing. Speaking of art, there is a few illustrations actually in the book. That is one of my pros for this novel, Masters of Death, is that there are illustrations and they're just really, really stunning. And one final thing about Olivia Blake, she is a prolific writer, but she's a talented, prolific writer. So I love that. It doesn't feel like she's just throwing things out and hoping something sticks. She has a very interesting, definitely more flowery writing style, but everything has been, I think, pretty solid. They're pretty good. So let me tell you my thoughts on Masters of Death. Up front, I personally am giving this right now a three out of five. And the only reason why I didn't rate it higher is because I think I made a mistake. My mistake was, and I recommend y'all do this too, 
pick up the actual novel and read it. For me, at least, or at least readers like me, I had a very hard time following the audiobook. The audiobook, it wasn't the narrator. He's amazing. He did a great job. It's just this book does not follow a chronological order to things. It is very fragmented, but it's not necessarily in a really, it's not done poorly, in my opinion. It just, it's a lot easier to follow in the novel because there are actual breaks where you can be like, okay, we're still within the same topic, but we're not bouncing from one time era to another, back to the present, and then to the past, and then another time to the past. I think if I actually read this novel, this would be a lot higher, and I went back and kind of skimmed through a couple places, especially when they were playing the games, because it was so dreamy, ethereal. I was like, okay, I know I'm missing so much here, so I actually went back and skimmed a lot of it, and more things start to, started to come together, and I was like, okay, this is actually a lot better than what I had originally taken away before. So I'm definitely going to come back to this, reread it, because the messages in this novel are really beautiful and very complex. Before I move on to the pros of this book, Another one of the cons that I did have is that you are following a whole host of different characters. Granted, Olivia Blake is, I think, kind of masterful in being able to give every person a strong individual personality. It's not difficult to follow, but there are definitely more background characters that will all of a sudden become more forefront and you're like, oh crap, I forgot they were even there. And that happened to me a lot, especially with the characters Isis and Cal. They seemed more towards the back, but then they started to find themselves in the front, a little in the end. Sometimes the characters would bury themselves. Our main characters in this novel First and foremost, it might seem like it's supposed to be Viola Merrick, who's the real estate vampire, but actually this is definitely a book about Fox Demora, who's the godson of death. Viola is just trying to sell a house, and there's all of these other characters in the background that are like, hmm, this isn't going to work. There's other things going on, especially with the ghost that's haunting the house, Tom. There's all of these little things that you don't really know about, so they need to solve this kind of mystery. Not just that, death is MIA right now, so they're trying to figure out all kinds of stuff. A gang of immortals, except for Fox Demora, he is the only mortal, I guess extended life moral, because he's been around for hundreds of years, but he still is technically mortal compared to the rest of them who have found this life-numbing immortality. So we have a ton of themes in this novel, a ton of characters, and a ton of folklore and mythology. It's actually kind of fun. Olivia Blake will mention certain gods and goddesses from usually a Western pantheon, so Nordic, Greek, etc. And we have a ton of bantering. The characters are kind of hysterical how they interact with each other. Fox is a little bit of an edgelord, but he's I like him because he actually has more than just being edgy to give him good character. He's a fair, I mean, he's just a complex person, and so is the rest of them. This novel is a great exploration of mortality, immortality, extending life. What are those actual pros and cons? And truly, this is a love story, and it's, it's I think, a very authentic beautifully done, sad, and tragic love story, and it's beautifully done, but it kind of leaves you feeling empty and fulfilled. It's so weird. So Fox Demora has a very strong relationship with a person of his past who has come in and out of his life for a very long time named Brant. He's a godling, and Brant is an immortal. Fox is not and it's more complicated than just this. But we go through this novel exploring their love, the different phases it has gone through, and where it is at currently and what that actually means. What does that stand for? 
within the parameters of who they are as people. So I don't want to go too far into this because I don't want to spoil this book. There are a couple little twists and turns in the novel, and I don't want to spoil it. Another thing is that Fox, because Fox Demora is a mortal, it seems to be thrown around quite often, especially since he's surrounded by immortals, being a godson of death, you know, a literal just entity, a being, death. I mean, kind of think of the endless, that's kind of how I was expecting death to be, just a facet of life. But being the godson of death, surrounded by immortals, like, his mortality is always being talked about, and in a way that is viewed as a weakness. It's a very cool story about why mortality is actually a strength and what those things entail. What are things that mortals have that immortals do not have? So we explore that in different facets of immortality. So our vampire, Viola, she used to be mortal, and then she was changed into an immortal being and she will never die. What does that look like? Versus, you know, we also have a ghost. It's kind of a similar situation as well. But then we have things like a reaper taking souls. We have archangels, people, godlings, things that have just, they will live forever. What does certain traits, especially mortal bonds, how is that viewed in the eyes of an immortal? And are those things that we truly need to seek? Overall, I love the theme and I want to reread this book so that I can get a better grasp of exactly all the little details that Olivia Blake was trying to present because they truly are very smart and beautiful. Even though the writing felt a little disjointed sometimes, the overall theme, or at least the scenes, were all connected per chapter. So even though we might be going all across time, or even to different character perspectives in the same time, it all still was fitting within a certain segment or theme or part of the story. But it it, it can be a little difficult to follow because it's not in your face or telling you that, oh yeah, we're going back 500 years now and these are the characters that we will be exploring today. There's a lot of honesty in this novel. So not only are we going through very, you know, human themes, I say human kind of in a way that's actually mortal, but there's a lot of feeling in this novel. It's not the actual words that you're reading necessarily, though they're quite stunning and Olivia Blake is fantastic. There's just certain interactions with the characters that maybe you would cling on to, the way they banter, and you might be like, I've done this before with somebody really close, or, you know, it's sometimes hilarious, it's a little dry, the humor, but there's more to that, it's that the connection that they have with each other, and how real it feels, even though a lot of the characters truly are just establishing a, a newfound relationship and they care deeply. It's really interesting. I think in some ways this book isn't necessarily meant to be understood in a rational way. It's meant to be felt. I hope that makes sense. Another thing I wanted to just touch on, and I can only touch on this because this is kind of, I would say, a little past 60% of the novel to the end, is some of the beautiful descriptions of this game they have to play. This particular scene is, I mean, it's really long, but I have to say I did have a hard time following, especially with the audiobook. I was struggling there. But I was trying to figure out exactly how to play this game that immortals play. And it just seemed like a lot of the, you know, in the scenes they would sit against their you know, alleged opponent. It was like they had, you know, a whole bracket where they were supposed to beat each other to the final two. And it's like an exploration of memory and thoughts and um, experiences. And, you know, when I kind of skim through it in the book, which again, I highly recommend, it made a little more sense, but I was still unsure about how you win or how you lose a game. 
So I do see that there's a lot of things that I definitely missed and why I still have a lower rating. But I have a feeling when I read this over again, I'm going to give this a higher rating because I think there's just so many complicated and very ambitious characters and dynamics and even just the exploration of characters that are in actual mythology placed into this novel. It's just really masterfully done and I think parts of it did go over my head. So I, I actually fully admit that could be on me. Just another pro, this is an LGBTQ plus amazing friendly book. Uh, a lot of Olivia Blake's stuff actually is. It features so many different kinds of people and obviously immortals from all around the world, different kinds of cultural norms, lots of cool stuff in this novel. I do recommend it again for the third time. Pick the actual novel up. Um, the The audiobook is great. Maybe you are better about listening than I am. Maybe that's something I have to work on. But I do recommend checking out Masters of Death by Olivia Blake. I think, you know, I read the second portion of the... I mean, Atlas Six was a great novel in my opinion. But then the second novel I felt like went a little crazy. In fact, I, I might actually have to review it or get like a cliff note version of it because I can't honestly remember. So I'm so glad to see that this is the Masters of Death novel is like an uptick for Olivia Blake and I can just see her growing and growing and growing. She is a very strong voice in the dark contemporary fantasy world. I'm very excited to see what she does next. If you are looking for some more dark reads to put onto your TBR, make sure to tune in every Wednesday and Friday. Wednesdays, we tend to have a bunch of books that we've curated for each week, for the month, all the dark reads you could possibly imagine for adults, for kids, YA books, and even nonfiction reads, if that's something that's of interest to you. And of course, uh, I like to talk about some comic books and graphic novels. Something new that we are doing in October, so make sure to join us for our Hocus Pocus cook-along that we're going to be doing. That's in our Facebook group. You can join us on Facebook at Dark Side of the Library or on Instagram, also at Dark Side of the Library. We'd love to see you there. We're going to be cooking a bunch of stuff from the Hocus Pocus cookbook to celebrate, you know, the witchy spooky season. We'd love to see you around. Make sure to spread the word about Dark Side of the Library. Check out our show notes. And most of all, thank you so much for tuning in every Wednesday and Friday. We appreciate you. Y'all have a creeptastic week. We'll see you next time.